Wow, that's bright. Wow. Yeah. That is bright. Um, <laughs> awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Marcia, it's, it's so good to see you. Good to uh, see you too. Really looking forward to chatting. Um, huge disclaimer, we're obviously one of your investors and happy, happy, very happy with that and uh, really enjoying working with you. And uh, hopefully you can share a little bit of what got us excited in this conversation and a little bit of insight into uh, um, many of your successes, but, but let's talk about Beauty Pie first, which is obviously the business you're building now. Um, maybe just to set the scene, it'd be great to hear from you a little bit about what is Beauty Pie, how does it work, and why did you uh, think Start it. Was, the time was right for this? Why are you doing this now? Sure. Um, well, I've been in the beauty industry now for 30 years. And one of the things that started to really irk me about it um, was that there really was a monopoly on distribution. Um, and we find that as consumers of beauty products, we're paying 20 times sometimes what the actual cost of goods of that product is. Um, and knowing that there started to be less and less places for a creator of brands like myself to distribute that would actually end up in building a profitable business. Uh, a lot of the large retailers were starting to have their own in-house incubators. So Sephora, for instance, has its own in-house incubator. Um, Alta will have its own in-house incubator. Boots will have its own in-house incubator. So if you're a person like me who loves to create a brand and wants to distribute it, there's nowhere to do it anymore. Um, because you'll have the retailers who used to be your partners. You were the creator and they were the retailer. Now being the creators themselves, However, they will take your brand, but they won't give it equal showing on the shelves. Um, so I thought, because I had an incredible network that I've built over the last 30 years of you know, Italian labs and French noses and Swiss skincare scientists, that I would go direct to consumer. Uh, I'd approach all of these labs to create ranges for a club where people could buy without the crazy retailer markups that are inherent to the traditional beauty industry. So it was a bit of a leap off a cliff. I did think everyone in the industry would want to kill me uh, because I was ripping the doors open and showing you know, the egregious markups that existed. Uh, but I, it was really the only way forward for someone who wants to do a brand now in, in beauty. It is so hard because it used to be that uh, you know, a retailer would take 50%. Now they take 70, and as we know, if you're not paying a retailer 70% now, or paying a landlord, you're paying Google or Facebook. Uh, so the idea for a club that had recurring revenue, where people came back uh, every month or every two months to shop for their beauty products and get much, much more competitive prices just seemed like an obvious thing to do. Now, the, the, I mean, maybe to elaborate a bit more on the pricing, because it's, uh, on face value, it looks crazy, right? You have a membership model, and then prices which are just radically different to anything you would see uh, on the high street. Yeah. When you were coming into to building Beauty Pie and thinking about this pricing, and my understanding is you spent quite a bit of time speaking to academics, other people, trying to understand the psychology of um, people's purchase in this category. I would, I would love to, I'm sure the audience would love to hear a little bit more about how you dug into that, what you learned, and why you felt this was gonna work, and ultimately why it does work as, a, as an interesting model. Sure. Well, as this is my first tech startup, <laughs> and also my first, uh, I guess, membership business, it's not a subscription, so we don't actually send anything out to people. It's more like, um, we, we like to call it like a luxury American Costco, but for all beauty products and wellness products. Um, I first read a fantastic book, if you haven't read it, uh, called Hooked by a behavioral economist named Nir Eyal. Um, and, and I remember actually, I think I was listening to it and walking, and every time something that was relevant would come up, I would stop and you know, take a note and figure out how this might apply to the business. And it was full of really great insights, some of them being, you know, sort of, there are 12, I'll probably remember six. Um, one is that you've got to have fuel, right, to get somebody to do something. So it might not be that the motivator for someone to switch to your beauty product is because it's cheaper. Um, it might be that you've got to still create desire for that product. So the same type of beauty marketing, the same type of pictures, the same, you know, the same type of descriptions and the desire building has to be there. Beauty is about pleasure, so it's not about rewards and there are two different parts of the brain. There are two reward systems in the brain. One is is pleasure and one is rewards. Um, and so you have to make sure that you're stimulating both. It's not always just about getting it cheaper, although getting it cheaper makes you feel egotistically smarter 
about yourself. So there is a, a boost um, in, in your dopamine, right, from feeling like you got a good deal. But at the same time, there is something called price value inference. And if something is too cheap, people will think it isn't of a high quality. And so the luxury industries, of course, have brainwashed all of us for a very long time to tell us that something is expensive, it must be good. And that's not necessarily always true, although more active ingredients in a product will make it more expensive. So we had to figure out online how to fight that price value inference. If something's going to be a low price, how do you then communicate that it's high quality? And so we do show two prices online. We show the non-member's price, so what the typical retail would be, and then we show a member's price, so if you are a member, what type of price you can access. Uh, there are so many, so many great behavioral economists that if you are doing any kind of model like this, you should be studying Dan Ariely, um, Nir Eyal. I mean, there's hundreds of them, and all available on, on YouTube, right, if you don't have access to them individually. There's also a great, I'm trying, it's called Nudge Stock. So if you're, if you're looking for more information from the greats of behavioral economics, there is on, online and every year Ogilvy sponsors, it's kind of like a, a conference um, based on Richard Thaler's work, um, which is about nudging people to do things. Um, and it's called Nudge Talk, and you can watch literally 36 hours of Nudge Talk speeches from all the greatest and smartest people in the world on, on YouTube an hour at a time, I would highly recommend. Amazing, amazing. Obviously, one of, the, one of the things you just talked about, obviously, is how do you position the, the product and then the brand to um, have, the, have the appeal of quality while you know, uh, massively discounting the price that people are used to paying. And you, you've been very successful building many, many brands um, kind of have that kind of magic touch. But as you came into this business, maybe with a little bit of the pricing and the positioning in mind, and going uh, direct to consumer uh, more than ever before. How, how has that brand building experience been? How have you managed to create Beauty Pie into a brand which people love? They think the products and they recognize the products being incredibly high quality and at the same time they are experiencing a radically different price point. That's a great question and we've sort of learned a lot as we've gone along the way. We're always experimenting with different formats of, uh, of communication. Certainly social media has had this incredible surge of popularity in the last few years, um, but is now a little bit on, on the downslide, I think. Um, and so you always have to follow what customers are spending their time on. Um, one thing that we're quite, I guess, quite lucky, but it's all part of, of my experience to have is uh, expertise in the beauty area. So for us, long form communication, newsletters, emails are really a huge source of shopping revenue from our customers. We are able, in long form, to describe why this product might be better than that product. We actually try and do it in good layman's terms, but include um, statistics and, you know, 92% of people who used this for however long loved it. Um, and, and really describe what a certain product does for you. I mean, number one in consumer goods is WIFM. If you don't know, that was what's in it for me. And you just have to always remember to go back to with them. Because if you're not describing what's in it for them, you're losing them, right? Um, so it is a little bit old school to be emailing your customers. But we generate so much of our revenue from email. Um, and also being able to remind people throughout the journey on their website you know, why a product might be different or better. Um, we have been hampered by some of our technology. We, we chose a really terrible platform at the beginning, so we're just almost now getting started with what we can do. Uh, but being able to really educate people. We, we use um, in our communications an acronym, which is uh, FRIDA. So it's fun. If it's not fun, you know, or um, if it's not reiterating what the proposition is and, and what the WIFM is for the customer, if it's not educational, um, if it doesn't demonstrate, and if it's not aspirational, we don't do it. And so we try and keep everybody really focused on, on Frida uh, when, when we're creating any kind of content uh, to, to try and stimulate sales or stimulate acquisition of new customers. Frida, okay, I'm gonna remember that. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, one of the things that we were impressed with and continues to be the case is you have incredible retention uh, and long-term engagement with your customers. Now, obviously, the membership model lends itself to that. If I've started paying for something and I, and I get good product, but I'm sure there's a, there's a lot more beyond that. 
Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the relationship you have with the customers. Um, obviously, you're delivering a message to them. What are they sending back to you? How do you take on board that feedback and, and keep um, the product catalog fresh, keep the relationship fresh and sustain those, that, that level of engagement? Sure. Lots of questions in there. I hope yeah. I don't forget them all. <laughs> <laughs> so, number one, a warning. I think our retention rate might have gone down one point. No. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, but it's oh, a terrible sorry. economy and there are all these articles out there about people not having their memberships anymore, so we may have dropped from like 73 to 72, but we're working on getting that back up. Um, obviously, you know, for, for generally women, right? We have a small contingent of men um, and, and of probably transgender people um, as members, but women love something new all the time. So built into our model, we work with about 50 of the, diff the best suppliers of beauty and wellness products around the world. And built into the model from the very beginning was constant new product drops. So it's kind of like Nike and sneaker drops, right? But it's beauty pie and beauty product drops. Um, so she always has something new to look forward to. I think it's really difficult if you don't have a dynamic product range to keep the interest of a customer who is constantly being, uh, you know, bombarded with marketing from other people. You, you almost have to be several brands in yourself to keep her interested. Um, we, of course, also remind her how much she saved. So it might be on an email, it might be when she logs into the website. I personally have saved 37,000 wow. pounds since Beauty Pie started. <laughs> of course, I buy a lot of candles and I buy a lot of gifts, but I always feel like if I'm not gonna, if I'm not gonna buy these products, why would she buy these products? If I don't like it, you know, why, is it good enough for me, then it's good enough for her. So I think, of course, keeping the quality up and if you are, lucky enough to be in an industry where you're selling something that you love, making sure that the standard is high enough for yourself. Um, we also find it really important to just respect the customer's intelligence. I know that sounds quite basic, um, but it's so important if you're speaking to her that you aren't trying to fool her into doing something and you know it because I think she feels it and then she loses trust. And having a customer trust you and trust your proposition and know that you are being um, upfront with them, it is really a two-way street. It's almost like a partnership when somebody is a customer of yours for that long. They want you to do well, right? And, and they are very invested. So we, to your point also about how do we in include the customer in that product development cycle um, from, from very early on, and this is one of the wonderful things about the internet, um, from very early on we've been able to communicate with her directly about what she wants, um, how, what, how does she feel about a new product that we've launched, what would she like to see us bring into the assortment, down to we will say we're going to launch five new candles, right? Here are their fragrance, here are their names and here are the fragrance triangles. Which ones would you buy and why? We will take a poll either on Instagram or Facebook or we'll do it through like SurveyMonkey and then we'll buy according to what they've said. And I can tell you it's never more than 3% off that poll. Um, we did another uh, sort of an exit poll and you haven't joined today. For a lot of customers who would come in, you haven't joined yet today, why not? And I was uh, talking to you about this a little bit earlier. Some, we are a membership model, so you have to buy a membership and commit to buying this membership in order to access the really lowest prices. So we said, you haven't joined as a member today, tell us why not, right? And the question was, I'd rather shop at retail and just get free shipping, or I'd rather pay $29 a year instead of 59 and get 50% off and blah, 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 or I'd rather have, I like the membership the way it is, right? And of course, when you send out a survey, you have to mix up the answers. So you gotta send to different cohorts in different, um, in different order, because there's order bias, and then you also have to make sure that there's no bias in the question and the way that we've worded it, because some people will, always agree with what you're already doing because they don't want to seem disagreeable. That's another thing from behavioral economics, right? So you, you got to make sure you're doing your surveys right. Interestingly, when we did the survey, about 27% of the people, even though they could be seven, saving 70% on everything by joining, 27% of the people said, I'd rather shop at full price and get free shipping, which is not rational, but I think what you learn is that people are totally irrational. They just, the emotions often take over. So if you think you're explaining to something to somebody really clearly, it doesn't matter. You have to watch what they're doing 
in their natural environment and then work around that and kind of go from there, it's a lot easier. Now, interestingly, 27% of people said they'd like to shop at full price, so we put up a full price journey. And in the first week, 27% of people shopped at full price. <laughs> Is that crazy? That's crazy. I mean, and, and those people, while we don't know how many more times they will shop with us, it's likely that they will probably shop at the same interval as members, according to a behavioral economist that I consulted about this. So they will actually be very profitable customers for us. Given that we have the machine in place, we have all of the products in place, we have the inventory in place, you know, we let her, let her do what she wants to do. Um, and, and I think one of our big learnings has been like, don't force them to do what we want them to do, let them do what they would naturally do. That's incredible insights. I think it's, it's so easy to find one user group who like buying the product you've decided to sell them at the price you've, or how, however you've decided to sell it, and just keep trying to keep finding more and more of those yeah. people. And it's a great reminder to, to remember that actually there will be alternative buying groups, perhaps irrational, irrational. so irrational you're not, you're not going to kind of logically deduce that this is the thing to do. And so in your experience, that was really learning from talking to them. Uh, do you, have you been able to leverage data as well to, to spot some of those insights? Well, given that we have had a terrible platform, we've kind of had to build this business so far with blinders on our faces, um, but we now have more data coming in and it's so incredibly helpful. However, I will caveat, the data tells you about yesterday. Mm. So, in the footwear industry, we would always say that buyers, you know, the, the buyers in the department stores, you know, they're experts at yesterday. They're not going to bring you the brand new thing. So, you still have to be out there being a little bit crazy and thinking, okay, what is the thing that we can't see, right? And I would always say that to my, uh, to my uh, head of e-commerce, they'd be very proud, well, our conversion rate is 3%, and I'd say, our conversion rate, 97% of the people coming in here aren't shopping from us. That's 97%, that's really terrible. And he'd say, but 3% is really good. Right. And I'm like, no, it's not. We're missing the majority of the people. So then you have to really focus on why are you missing them? And so some of these new user journeys that we're looking at are, uh, I guess, our attempt to try and figure out who are all those other people and how do we have something for them as well? Because we do have the very best products out there. We're getting them from the very best sources. We believe in them. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a great place to shop no matter how you want to shop. So why wouldn't you? But let's make that really easy for him, her, them, no matter how they come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, yeah, when we invested, I think you were just uh, providing the service to people within Europe. Um, but then you made the move to the US and that's gone really, really well. Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about the challenge, how you, how you kind of took that on? Was it kind of copy and paste? Did you have to think about things in a bit of a different way? And what's, what's led to that success? That's a really great question. Um, I think the US, actually we're only in the UK, we're not even in Europe yet. Software issue, but that has opened up as well. So this year is like a big year. Actually it'll be next year that's a big year of opening up for us, so it's really exciting. Um, in the US, I think what you have to remember is that the US customer has a, a lot of choice. Right, it's a plethora of choice out there, and there are a lot of things that have already been done. Um, and they are bigger spenders, and they, are, so, and they want to move really quickly, and they're not necessarily as considered with their cash. And of course, I'm generalizing hugely, but it does seem that way so far. Um, and they don't necessarily want something that's really inexpensive. Um, more customers in the US shopping at full price because they don't necessarily understand the model and they just want to do something fast. So they'll see something, they want to click on it, they want to buy it, they don't necessarily want to consider. Um, so the funnel may be different for the US customer. Uh, if you are on a membership model or a subscription model, you might just want to let them buy the product as well. I think uh, Rent the Runway, which is a business that sends are you familiar? I know yeah. you're a guy, but yeah, yeah okay. Um, <laughs> that sends up clothing, right? You can rent your clothing. It has started to sell clothing because, of course, if you rent something and you love it, you know, why not buy it? Uh, whereas previously, they just rented it. So for us, what we had to really do is go into the market and then look at what does she, what's already there? Because 
one of our biggest hurdles with the, when we first entered was that she thought we were a subscription box. And that's because there are so many subscription boxes that already exist. So the heuristic for her was to look at it and think, oh, this is another one of those, when it's in fact not. We don't send you anything. So people would sign up and then a month later say, well, I didn't get my box. And it was like, we don't send you a box. You're paying for access to these prices. So then we realized, oh, maybe we need to send her a box. Right? She wants a box, raise the price, send her a box, and then everybody's happy and she gets you know, what she thinks. So we are currently now building that team, but also looking at with, again, all the infrastructure that we've built, what is the best and easiest way to deliver this in an understandable fashion to a consumer who has seen something familiar and may get easily confused because they're just like rushed off their feet doing whatever it is they do. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, that's awesome, thank you. Okay. Um, you know, your, your previous businesses, and even Beauty Pie at the, the start, were bootstrapped. You didn't take venture capital. Mm -hmm. um, but now you have taken venture capital yes. in the last few years. What's, uh, what led to that decision? What was different about this business? And I'll tell you, Daniel, the venture capital thing is quite stressful. <laughs> what? Don't tell me that. Well, only because it's so much less stressful when you're only spending your own money. And so if you are a responsible individual, I'm quite a frugal, responsible individual. Now I feel like I have to perform for the investors, and I hate it. <laughs> but I'll just say a little ad for Balderton. If you, you could not find a more supportive group of investors um, than Balderton, and also one of our other, well, actually all of our investors are great, but we love Balderton uh, for, for there's so much support that's offered. Um, and this is my first VC-backed business. Um, I always just stuffed whatever profit I had under my mattress and then reinvested it. Um, but when I was doing my first tech startup, trying to find tech talent of any grade was quite difficult if you were not VC-backed. So we would interview people. Um, and, and think, wow, you know, you get to the end of the interview, you think, this is the one, this is the one. And their question, when you would say, well, do you have any questions, mm -hmm. was always, so are you venture backed? And then my answer was always, yeah, no, I'm, I'm funding it myself. And then they wouldn't join because I think venture backed businesses are always, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that everybody is like so excited to be in a venture backed business. Um, and of course, it provides a little bit more stability. As long as, um, as long as there's enough capital. Um, and so we found that as soon as we had venture backing, we got a lot of great talent. Mm -hmm. And so tapping into the talent networks that uh, companies like Balderton have, um, and then also the partners and the operating partners who have so much experience, that's been incredibly helpful. So besides the self-induced stress of wanting to do well for you, <laughs> which I just need to work on that, you know, as my own individual baggage, um, it is, super helpful to have people who know what they're doing in the tech world because it isn't what I come from um, and it has opened so many doors. So I am eternally grateful um, to, to have had that opportunity. It's also really fun, I think, for me. Uh, at this stage of my career, this is my fifth business. And so to have something where I can enter a completely different realm and really learn every day from so many talented people, uh, it's, a, it's quite a gift. Yeah, well, we've enjoyed working with you. I think. Um it sounds like a, a, a lots of benefits, a bit of extra stress, a bit of extra kind of accountability. Uh, I think you, uh, you're a fantastic steward of the money you've been given, so um, thank you. Um, maybe, maybe kind of looking forward, what's, uh, you've talked a little bit about the US and hopefully Europe, the rest of Europe next. Yeah. Uh, and next year, what else is coming down the line for Beauty Pie? I think we can oh, so, so many options. I think we're, we're still learning. We're looking at the different models that we can have with the people who want to sh you know, shop full price, the people who want to be on a mini membership, um, the people who are the hardcore members of, of whom there are a lot. Um, and we'll be looking at which model suits different markets. Again, we've got that whole machine set up. The marketing machine is ready. The, uh, the manufacturing machine is ready. The supply chain machine is ready. Um, so we can enter you know, the next market quite easily. We just have to do the math and make sure that it makes sense. And I think not bite off more than we can chew. Uh, you see a lot of, uh, and I've, I've talked to a lot of businesses who have just opened websites all over the place thinking 
that that was going to be a good thing to do and it would be profitable. But most of them retreat with their tail between their legs if they do too many at the same time. So we're going to be quite measured about it. Just make sure that we open one at a time or two. Make sure that we can really deliver um, you know, and go deep and, um, and make a success out of it for, awesome. you, for you and for me. For, for all of us and, and, for the, and for the customers. Right. Well, look, we're out of time. Thank you so much. It, you know, I think it's, uh, it's great to get this insights. There's so much more. You make it kind of sound very easy. Uh, we just launch a brand, we do this, we do that, and, and, and the customer loves it. Of course, it's incredibly hard, and mm. um, I think you've given us a little bit of, bit of glimmer about the magic behind making that successful. Um, so thanks again, and uh, great to see you. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you. Okay. Should we go that way?